Um, welcome. My name is Melissa Birch. Um, I'm with the Clean Energy Resource Teams at the University of Minnesota Extension, and we are super excited to welcome you to the fourth in our series of webinars for ambassadors. Uh, and this one is how to speak solar. Um, so we're asking that you please be sure to put um, in the chat where you're joining from and, and also a question that you have about solar. Um, I am joined today by Anna Peterson, Colby Abaz, and Jennifer Lindahl, who are also with CERTS, and they will be presenting on solar. Uh, next slide, please. And um, just a little bit about CERTS real quickly. Um, we are a statewide partnership of four different organizations, uh, the University of Minnesota Extension, the Great Plains Institute, the Minnesota Department of Commerce, and the Southwest Regional Development Commission. And our mission is to uh, connect individuals and communities to resources. So that could be information, that could be financial resources, it could be other people, uh, but connecting people to resources to identify and implement community-based clean energy projects. So we do energy conservation, efficiency, renewable energy, and beneficial electrification. Uh, next slide, please. This particular webinar is, as I mentioned before, part of our series for community energy ambassadors. And next slide, please. Um, this is a, a relatively new program that we launched to help people help their communities do clean energy projects. So um, this started out as a, um, a program specifically oriented around federal um, incentives, but we're, we've expanded it and are deepening it to help folks um, build their own capacity to help their communities in a variety of, of ways around clean energy. Next slide, please. And in so doing, to really uh, make sure that the clean energy transition um, is rooted in community needs and aspirations. So that's really what this is uh, all about. Next slide, please. Um, this, as I mentioned, is the fourth in a series of webinars. It's part of uh, some the online self-paced training path um, to becoming a certified community energy ambassador. So we will be launching uh, shortly a, um, a form, a, a survey where you can record that you were part of this webinar. Um, and um, then as you go through the various topics that we cover, eventually you'll be able to do your own project around um, clean energy and uh, become a certified energy ambassador. So next slide, please. Today, uh, we'd like to know, first of all, how much do you know about solar? So like a one would be what's solar? Five is I'm an installer. Um, so one to five, kind of where are you at uh, in terms of your knowledge of solar? Seeing a fives, twos, threes. Okay, so kind of a, a range of different knowledges about solar. Uh, next slide, please. Today, what we're going to be talking about is solar terms and concepts, some storage, and then simple steps to solar. So how to get from, I'd like to do a solar project to actually having a solar project um completed so with that i am going to turn it over to anna i almost started talking before unmuting that's the joys of webinars so welcome everyone i am anna peterson i am the northwest regional coordinator for the clean energy resource teams and i am located way up in crookston minnesota in the um top part of the 
state. <clears throat> so um, seeing that we have a wide range of people on, uh, some of this is going to be kind of um, basic for some of you, but yet uh, when we have other people watching the recording, some of them um, might need to know the basics of this. So here we go. So <clears throat> as far as solar cells goes, um, those make up our modules that are um, our solar panels and modules that make up the total arrays. The cells convert the sunlight into energy, and those are the building blocks to our modules. They are about three feet ish wide to about five to six feet tall. The array is um, all of the panels that are connected into your system. Mostly, what you see is going to be the monocrystalline which is each, um, each cell is made from a single crystal sliced very thin. Sometimes for um, ground mounted, you will see bifacial, which means they will absorb the reflected sunlight from the ground as well as sunlight from above. Modern panels are around 20% efficient meaning 20% uh, of the sunlight energy is turned into electricity. The solar modules produce direct current moving in one direction. The inverters take that energy and change it into alternating current so that it can be used by our electrical system. The string converters, those are less expensive they have one single inverter for each or for all of the panels. So this means you're really stuck with that system size forever. The microinverters, those are more typical. And the advantage is that um, they perform better under they these ones perform better under partial shading and as you expand you simply add an inverter with your panel and it grows with you um, and then you can also monitor each panel um, they have like an app that goes with it so there's a lot of advantages to having these micro inverters um, on this slide, uh, we used a water hose as an example to help um, explain this a little bit for um, just basically. So um, kilowatts measure the rate of energy consumption or production and kilowatt hours measure the quantity of energy consumed or produced. So using a water hose as an example, kilowatts is how much water is flowing through your hose. And kilowatt hours is how much water is in your pool after an hour. So another example you could use is if you use one kilowatt in your microwave oven for two hours, it consumed two kilowatt hours. And if a 10 kilowatt solar array operates under standard conditions for two hours, it's gonna produce 20 kilowatt hours. So a kilowatt um, will be used to answer how big a solar system you're getting or how much electricity an inverter or solar panel handles. Kilowatt hours will be used when talking about how much energy is produced or used in a period of time, day, month, or years. System sizes, the size of a PV system is usually measured in kilowatts. In other words, it's a system that can produce electricity of nine kilowatts. And that's what we used here in this example of, a, of this home. It's a nine kilowatt system on this 
home example there. So if you were operating under standard conditions for an hour, it would produce nine kilowatt hours of electricity. A 40 kilowatt AC is generally the largest system customers will want to install due to net metering rules. And to give you a sense of how much area or space a 40 kilowatt system would take up, it would take up the area of a tennis court. There are three main types. Um, of uh, photovoltaic systems. And the three main types of systems are um, listed here. They have the, the, the grid connected is the most common and the cost and most cost effective. It is good to know that if you have solar, you still lose power during a power outage unless you have a battery backup system. A typical battery backup adds about 50% of the cost to your system. Standalone is off the grid, which is more of a lifestyle. Some um, places this makes sense to have. Rates and rules are regulated by state law. You are paid a retail rate for your excess generation. You get paid at a retail rate similar to what you pay. You are limited in size depending on your utility. Co-ops and municipals have a max of 40 kilowatts. Tax credits. So um, the simple version of this is a tax credit is taxes that you would have to pay, but the IRS counts as already paid by the credit. There are about 30 pages of IRS code that tell you what you are taxed on. The other, other 6,000 pages tell you how to avoid the first 30 pages. Hello, everyone. I'm Colby Abaz. I'm CERT's Business Renewable Energy Consultant based out of Finland, Minnesota, way up here in the Northeast. And so today I'm going to be talking to you all about storage. Um, storage is a really kind of evolving, rapidly evolving option that can be added to a solar system and obviously for a battery backup or an off-grid standalone system is a generally mandatory part of the system to keep it functional. Uh, next slide. So storage for residents or small businesses is generally going to look like batteries. There are a lot of other technologies out there that can be used by utilities and in special circumstances, but in general, we're going to be talking about batteries here today. Interestingly enough, uh, one of the viable technologies that's still being used regularly is a 100-year-old technology of the lead-acid battery you're probably most familiar with interacting with in your car. Um, but any system you're installing now, lithium-ion technology has evolved a lot over recent years and, very importantly, has come down in price a lot. And so pretty much any system that is being installed right now should be using some form of lithium ion batteries. Um, there are a lot of different chemistries and different trade-offs of those different design elements and chemistries for lithium ion batteries. So it's a good thing to ask your installer kind of what trade-offs they're choosing with the system they're pro or proposing for you. Batteries are kind of sized and determined based on their kilowatt hours. That's kind of what was talked about earlier of kind of how much energy they can store. And that is a very important number because the bigger the battery you need, the more expensive it's going to be, and but the more it'll be able to power or the longer it'll be able to power it for. So next slide. So why would you want to add storage to the system? I mean, as Anna talked about earlier, if you don't have storage, uh, you generally lose power when it mix down. And so one of the biggest reasons to get storage is for resiliency of or resiliency of being able to have your system 
either for the home or kind of critical devices or some devices be able to stay up and the power from the grid goes down. Obviously, it's a lot cheaper to only run critical devices and not try to run your whole home. So those are the kind of questions you want to be asking and talking about with your installer as far as what that sweet spot is for you. Um, there are some other reasons to have storage as well. Maybe it's a remote location or maybe it's a mobile location and you're not sure you're going to always have a connection to a grid. And so you want some storage to be able to use your solar power uh, directly on site. And sometimes solar can also be used to help you use more of your solar panel energy. You're on site kind of behind the meter and do sell less of it back to the grid, um, which can have financial or um, just kind of other motivations and benefits that it provides to you. Next slide. So you've decided you want to merge your system. How do you go about doing that? Uh, most solar installers can um, incorporate storage into your system. And even if you're not thinking you're going to want storage right now, it would be a good idea to ask your solar installer um, if they can design a system that's kind of so storage ready and kind of has the right components and has components that are compatible with adding storage to that system later. And so um, it's good to ask your solar installer if they have any particular trainings or certifications relating to storage, because there are some nuances to that. And there are training programs out there to help make sure that solar installers are making informed decisions, especially in an environment where the technology is so rapidly changing and quickly evolving and adapting. But that big thing you want to do is talk with your installer, maybe talk with your energy auditor if you did an energy audit, and decide what you actually want to run on that battery and for how long. Are you trying to run your whole house for two or three days of a major storm power outage? That's going to need a very big battery. Are you trying to just keep your fridge and freezer going and maybe a couple lights or keep your sump pump going for three hours that's a very different picture as far as what storage you want. And so those are the kind of things you want to be looking at as far as how much energy do you really need to store and for how long. Batteries are not viable, unfortunately, for storing all that beautiful sunshine we get in the summer for use in the winter. That's kind of a very long duration type storage that is just not the way that batteries are designed. It's really meant to get you through cloudy days or get you through power outages or hours or days. And then figuring out, well, does that fit within my budget? What is my budget? Batteries are not cheap and they are a component that does over time. And so you'll probably be doing a little bit of back and forth of what are what do I want to run off of it and how long? How much is that going to cost? Well, maybe I don't have to run so much or, oh, well, that's not too bad. Maybe I can add these other loads to it as well. And get some creature comforts in a power outage. And next slide, and I will pass it off to our lovely next speaker to give you the simple steps to solar. All right. Hello, everybody. I hope that you can hear me. Um, my name is Jennifer Lindahl, and I am the Southeast uh, um, Certs Coordinator. Um, and now that you uh, have the terms and concepts, um, an understanding of them, and you've uh, learned a little bit about sol storage, let's talk about the steps to getting solar. Next slide. <clears throat> so getting ready. Uh, the first thing is energy efficiency. Um, suggestion talking to your utility company to find out if they have any if they offer energy energy assessments energy audits um, interchangeable um, or they might have a rebate that you could use uh, for um, that energy audit the other thing is going to our uh, website going to the certs website we have lots of home energy guides that can help you get started the next you're going to want to do is ask questions. So um, is your site um, a sunny site? How about your roof? Is your roof relatively new? Something to think about. Um, you know, uh, panels generally last for 25 years or so. So ideally, your roof should have at least that much life left. Not that you can't take off the panels to re-roof. You certainly can. There's just going to be some um, cost involved. 
The other thing to, to ask questions about is local government rules that might affect your project. So for example, um, maybe your um, homeowners association has some rules around solar installation. And then determining your budget. So are, do you have a budget where you can pay cash or are you considering a loan? And then do you have enough income taxes to access the solar tax credit, which Anna talked about earlier? Um, some credit unions do have specific clean energy improvement loans. So that is something that you can certainly look into. Next slide. So once you are energy efficient, you've asked some questions um, and you have an understanding of maybe how you can um, uh, pay for the solar installation, you're going to want to get some bids. So we suggest getting uh, bids from multiple installers, at least three. Um, finding an, an installer um, and then asking the questions. So there's two great resources on our website. We have, um, you can go and look for a list of installers. Now, these are just a list of installers that are in uh, the state. They're not necessarily um, in any specific order. And we don't, necess we don't um, uh, recommend one installer over the other. The other thing is we do have questions to consider asking when considering installers. Next slide. Using an online tool to estimate your production um, of your solar system. So an online tool like PV Watts Calculator, um, you're going to be able to um, input your data. And then it also, the system utilizes factors like historical weather patterns um, and other elements around what you enter. This is going to give you a pretty good estimate of what um, your solar system on your home or in your location can produce. Next slide. So compar comparing bids is really important, but it's also probably pretty overwhelming. Um, so here's a couple of examples. One of the things that we suggest doing is figuring out how much um, that system is going to cost per watt. So a reasonable price range right now is between $3 and $3.50 per watt installed. So for example, uh, look at example one in the box there, a nine kilowatt system, let's say it costs $30,000, nine kilowatts is 9,000 watts. You take that 30,000 and you divide it by the watts and you'll get $3.33 um, per watt installed. In example two, we have a six kilowatt system. Let's say that costs $25,000. Same six kilowatts is 6,000 watts. Divide that um, 25,000 by 6,000 and you have um, 417 watts. So $4.17 per watt, excuse me. Um, so that's gonna give you an idea. Think about uh, right now, um, the most cost is gonna be that labor. So right now, uh, solar panels are between 50 and 70 cents. And then adding all that installation cost plus the mounting components and the inverters and such. So next slide. Once you've picked an installer, um, go ahead and sign that contract and, and work towards getting your system installed. One of the great things about um, that your installer is they're gonna work with your utility to get everything interconnected. So once you have that installer, they're gonna do a ton of work to make sure that your system is um, connected to your utility up and running. Um, and then once that's all done, we want you to share your story. You're gonna be an inspiration for others um, you know, I think that we all sometimes feel overwhelmed when we're trying something new. So having somebody that has done this before that you can talk to, um, that is so, it's so useful to have that. So please share your story. All right, next slide. So examples of a residential solar project. Next slide. So this is an actual home. This belongs to one of our um, CERTS colleagues. The, the home is um, just over a thousand square feet. It's located in central Minnesota. This is an all electric home. So there's no gas and no propane. No propane. They do have an air uh, source heat pump and in-floor heat uh, with a boiler system. And this house on average uses 800 kilowatt um, hours per month. 
So for the whole year, um, that is 9,600 kilowatt hours. Next slide. So again, just over a thousand square feet. Uh, the roof orientation is Southwest. There is some shading in the winter time. Um, so they went with a nine kilowatt DC system, which of course, you know, there's a difference in the AC. So that's seven and a half kilowatt AC. Um, and they went with microinverters. And so their actual production, um, annual production is 9,100 kilowatt hours. And if you look over, you can see in the kilowatt calculator or the PV uh, watts calculator, um, that 9,353, that was the estimate that that calculator gave. So um, it's a good estimate for what they could have expected. Let's go to the next slide. So let's talk financials. Um, so again, uh, they went with a nine kilowatt system. The upfront cost was 30,000. With that 30% tax credit, you can subtract 9,000 from that. And the cost after the credit was $21,000. To figure out, um, you know, going back Uh, ahead of time, how much an estimate uh, for um, for your system for that year. You can also figure out the value of energy uh, production. So um, if you know the cost of what your utility is paying, or you're paying for your utility, which you can find on your bill. Um, for example, this is 11 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And we know uh, the value or the 9,100 9, kilowatt hours for the system energy production, um, the value of that is just over $1,000. And so going again back to that um, PV calculator, you could calculate an estimate of what uh, production you can expect from your system. The other thing to think about is that utilities, utility raises their prices. And so right now we're saying that there's an estimated annual increase of 2%. And that's a pretty good conservative estimate. So the, the value of that energy production of that solar is going to continue to increase. All right, that is it. That is the overview of our um, how to talk solar. Um, if um, you need to reach out to us, please do. You can use that QR code. That'll take you to our website. Otherwise, Anna, Colby, or I would be happy to either answer any questions that you have or connect you with somebody who can answer those questions. And I think that's what we're going to go to right now is questions. And I think you can put your questions in the chat or I think, Maggie, are you going to um, handle the questions? Maybe I'll turn it over to you. I think, Melissa, feel free to jump in if you like. Um, Colby has kindly been answering some of the questions here in the chatters, but I see you have your, go ahead, Melissa, sorry. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's actually answer them aloud as well, just, you know, for accessibility purposes. Uh, so one of the, the first question is, uh, how do payments for production work on systems greater than 40 kW? Um, and Colby answered that uh, systems that are larger than 40 kW might still fall under the net metering rules for investor owned utilities. Um, so that would be Ottertail Power, Minnesota Power, or Excel. Uh, so if that is your utility, the cap is actually 120% uh, of your expected energy usage, you know, if that's higher than a 40 kW system would provide. Um, then, uh, for a municipal or a, a co-op, rural co-op, we're looking, um, at that 40 kW, uh, cap, and then, um, you would be selling power back at an avoided cost rate, which is like the wholesale rate, which is about three to four cents per kilowatt hour. So, so it's much, much lower, which is why most folks stay within the, uh, 40 kW um, limit. Uh, will we be talking about rebates for solar that don't require a tax liability that are part of the Inflation Reduction Act? So on that one, there, there are grants available to businesses, so rural, uh, 
rural small businesses and um, agricultural producers. And um, those are part of the USDA's Rural Energy for America program. And um, so if that's, if you have a rural small business or um, if you're a farmer, please feel free to reach out to us. We can help you through the process of, of looking um, at that grant. But like, as Colby said, there aren't, um, there aren't federal or state rebates for residential solar. You could check with your utility. Um, most don't, but a few do. So go ahead and, and check with your utility um, to see if they have any. But if you are a rural small, if you do have a rural small business or if you are a farmer, please feel free to reach out to us and we can help guide you through the, the REAP grant process. Uh, let's see. And then um, we have some technical weeds, which are which are always good. And I'm going to let Colby talk about the technical weeds rather than just reading it. <laughs> yes, no, definitely. So um, it was not so much framed as a question, but some helpful um, little tidbits were added by um, one of our lovely attenders. I imagine you were, yeah, or one of the ones who is very familiar with solar. So that's always great to get some other perspectives. And so I just added some supplemental info to that in the kind of comparison of string inverters versus microinverters. Um, for residential rooftop solar, you will almost always see microinverters being used. Um, a lot of that has to do with code requirements that require each panel to have a shutoff to kind of keep the voltage anywhere in the system low enough so that it's reduces the risk to firefighters if they have to cut through your roof. Um, and so because of that, the microinverter provides that function automatically and then has those other benefits as well as far as assisting with any sort of shade conditions or any panel failures, things like that. Um, if you do have a string inverter for your system, as a, if it's a roof mount, um, there'll be a DC component that provides all those same functions and that shutoff function for each panel. Um, but then those will all feed into that one bigger inverter, which is a single point of failure. So that definitely is a consideration. Um, ground mount is really where string inverters excel um, because they can be a little bit cheaper, a little bit more efficient. And so you can have a whole bunch of panels in a row. And they're generally in that use case, there's less shading concerns. And even if there is partial shading, most modern panels are built internally with diodes that kind of prevent one part of the panel from being shaded, taking down the whole system and will just reduce your solar generation by a relatively small amount. So most systems I'm seeing um, being proposed for small businesses and residential include microinverters. Um, but that is definitely a question to ask your installer as far as like, oh, why did they choose one technology over the other? And they should be able to give you a good answer to that. And if not, maybe get a different quote and compare. Uh, it looked like another question popped up. Uh, yes, it looks like Shaylin shared a direct link to our page that lists all the solar grants incentives. So that's definitely I encourage everyone to check that out. Um, I believe it's that same page or it's a very similar page that also lists some grants and incentives for and rebates for energy efficiency, uh, storage, energy storage, and other um, options you might be exploring. And then uh, we have a question. Can yeah. you review the math relationship between the increase in Excel energy rates and how people with solar benefit even as electricity costs go up? This is often tricky to convey to community members. Yeah, so I don't live in Excel territory, so I'm not super familiar with um, this particular uh, rate increase that has just happened. Um, but it sounds like kind of what you're getting at. It's generally the advantage solar provides where when you install a solar system, your installer or you've usually done some math to figure out, oh, what are your cost savings from installing the solar system? As we all know, stuff gets more expensive over time. And so 
one advantage of solar is you're prepaying for the next 20 to 30 years of your energy generation. And so as the utility prices go up, kind of the cost that you paid for your power is going to stay the same because that solar is going to keep generating it at that same rate. And so that's kind of one advantage of solar is it kind of fixes that cost. That is one thing to check for bids that you're receiving. Um, if they include financial modeling, check what their assumption of the increase to the price of electricity is going to be. That is one place that sometimes installers will use a higher number. Um, generally, two to three percent inflation of electrical utility prices is considered industry norm. Um, but obviously, the payback and return on investment looks better if you put five percent there or some other number. And so that is one place to check um, your installer's financial modeling as far as there is a number usually factored into that for how much more will electricity cost 20 years from now when I'm still producing my own power. I hope that answers your question. I think I would I would second that that concept of prepaying for your electricity um, as a way of explaining it. And I live out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so a lot of folks around here have propane. And a lot of times you'll prepay your propane so that you have a lower cost when you go to fill in the winter. It's a very similar thing, except instead of being like over the winter, it's like over the next 25 years, you're prepaying for um, that energy. Other questions? I see Maggie has put uh, in the chat the survey for today's session. Um, so this is kind of a, a last call for questions. Um, and please do take the survey. It is a way that we can, um, you know, record that you were here and you can work toward that cert certified community energy ambassador certification. And um, that seems like I don't I don't see any more questions. So thank you so much for joining us today, and um, we hope to see you again soon. Enjoy the rest of your day.